life Whether you're ready or not Sometimes it's rough And it takes all that you've got But he's been here Just waiting for you to knock To take his hand Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight we have uh, seminarians from St. John Vianney Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, we have Ryan Adorjan and Eric Spohr uh, here tonight to tell us about a college seminary there that's packed to the rim with seminarians and the great work that they're doing. And they're going to share also about Vianney Media. That's uh, an outlet or an apostolate of the seminary. So good to see yeah. you, Doug. You too, Father. Yeah, how you doing? And we're going to talk about your shirt during the show. Yes. But we don't have much time in this opening segment because we have some clips of some interviews I got to do with people involved in the film When the Game Stands Tall. It opened recently in theaters and it's a true story about a De La Salle High School in Oakland, California area. And they had a 150 game winning streak uh, over 12 years. They lost and the movie's really about that, that following season. And it's got a lot of great gospel values in it about love and humility and uh, service and uh, so there's a lot of great elements. So we're going to be rolling clips during the show here of the actors and some of the coaches. I think the first clip we have in this opening segment is coach uh, Bob Latticer, the actual head coach and his assistant uh, coach Terry Edson. And then we're going to go right into the coach, into the, into the clip where Jim, with Jim Caviezel. I interviewed Jim Caviezel and Michael Chiklis who played the coaches. So we hope you enjoy these interviews. Uh, Coach Lott, I wanted to ask you, I heard that in your own life you were greatly influenced by a, a football coach. Could you tell us how that shaped your life? You know, I kind of ta uh, took a little bit from all the coaches I had, good and bad. Mm -hmm. So um, as I went through my career, I was my high school coach was great. He was very knowledgeable. My, my college head coach was really good too, Daryl Rogers. But I was coached by all other all other types of coaches. So right. some some coaches are like, I, I don't know if I'd want a coach like that. Or right. so I tried to take the best out of all of them. Okay. And you all are a team. You've worked together for many years. Could you describe the right relationship? Uh, I think our, our relationship is one, uh, first of all, based on uh, mutual respect. We've been, we, I think, you know, we've been friends for 34 years, um, and our value, I mean, although we're different personalities, our values, uh, we've always linked together with our values, and we've really developed a great relationship, and I think we kind of stood side by side building that program together with, you know, what we wanted to accomplish. In the movie, we saw uh, elements of like the, the chapel sessions, the prayer meetings, and the commitment cards. Can you describe the, I'll put this to both of you, the, the, the chapel sessions, what would happen there? Well, we'd usually start out with a, a, uh, a song, and then we, uh, a requirement was that they had to bring in a New Testament uh, scripture piece that they'd have to speak to, and then a motivational, some other motivational uh, reading that they'd have to bring also. and. Once those were presented by the kids, they had to tell what it meant to them or why they brought those or why they chose them. And then we opened it up to the whole team for discussion. And then Terry and I would usually uh, conclude whatever it was that was discussed or brought in. Um, it was real powerful. It's, it's something that you get to do away from the field. A lot of it has nothing to do with football and uh, it's consistent with what our school does and in the classroom. So. We want to, inf want to infuse that into our team also. Yeah, chapel gives us a chance to get away from everything and, and pray together and, and just be each other in a, more, in a spiritual sense, which we think is really important. So every Thursday, you all would pray together and have that reflection. The day before every game, whatever that, whatever that game is, the day before right. the game. And you also encourage the, the young people to ex express some of their emotional life. Would that happen at the chapel session? Or? Yes. Yeah. yes. And why was that so important? It was important because uh, I wanted, we want those kids to know that there's people there to support them. 
and there mm -hmm. are people that always be there for them. And it's safe environment to do that. It's okay to open up and tell how you're feeling. And it's okay to open up and tell your fears or your triumphs mm -hmm. and share it with other people. Everybody's there to help them and everyone's there to support. We hear a lot about leadership today, forming leaders. You all talk a lot about following though and serving. Could you tell us about that theme that you imparted to the players? Well, I think one of the greatest leaders of all time was actually uh, told us all that you have to follow first. Right. The first will be last and the right. last will be right. first. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, I think that's a, a very strong way to, uh, to lead, is to humble yourself and to be an example. In your own faith life, how would you describe that? Uh, not believing that I'm any more important than, than anybody else, that I'm just a part of the, the, the whole picture, that all of us have a, a place. You know, we all have a soul, we all have a heart, and, and we're basically all in the same boat. So mm -hmm. I've always kept that in perspective. Uh, yeah, for me, it's always bringing God's love into my everyday life and my everyday relationships. Mm -hmm. But Jim, I wanted to ask you, what drew you to this character? Um, probably, uh, well, uh, someone that was very close to my own faith, but the, the uh, man who is absolutely authentic, a coach that isn't, uh, you know, they say there's a saying, what you do in private is who you really are. Um, this guy, I, I happened to watch a documentary where the boys that he was coaching or looking at him and their eyes were glowing uh, as if they were about ready to cry and their hearts you could see were burning and he said that's where I need you to be in order to and I thought of that, that that's the best moments of my life the best moments have I that I've done great things and many things that I was on uh, not proud of but that I w had uh, some form of redemption because I had great leaders like this guy that helped me to change Help me to become a better uh, individual, and 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 and, and uh, I'm a product of them. And it's interesting because he's not a very loud person at all. He's very quiet. You played him that way. Sure. Nice house. And yet he was able to he's reach people in such an effective way. Mean? Well, when Look, the Navy SEALs come to town, picked. you'll see that when they're uh, smart, talking to the Iron troops and through training in Coronado, they're they are not big yellers, but. There is fear that comes out of out. those guys' ears when Who knows how to teach quietly kids to when they get go up to them and say you're not getting it done. And you don't have to raise your voice. It's just what it's not uh, what you say, it's 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 how you say it sometimes. Right. And Michael, I read that you'd mentioned that you wanted to do an inspirational story and looking to do more of that in your own career. Is that what well, drew you? Uh, yeah, that certainly would attract me to this project. And, uh, I was the captain of my football team in high school and my coaching staff at, at that school were very much uh, philosophically in league with these gentlemen and I just thought you know this is the kind of movie I want to be involved with something that, that, that my family anyone can see and it's not about football it's, it's about uh, adver overcoming adversity and, and uh, six, teaching boys to become down, together, uh, compassionate, uh, uh, conscionable, uh, uh, accountable together. young men mm -hmm. and how Four they would go out into the world and conduct themselves and rely upon each other. What would you want, Jim, for young men to take away from this movie? Latticer uh, spoke to his players one time when he says, I'm, I'm not asking you to play a perfect game. That's impossible. What we're asking of you and what you should be asking yourselves is to give a perfect effort on every play from snap to whistle. He said very clearly, love means you can depend on me. Welcome back. Uh, welcome to Life on the Rock. We have two great guests, two young seminarians, early 20s from St. John Vianney Seminary, College Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks. 
Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Father. You guys are young. You're only 22 and 21. Yeah, and uh, tell us about this seminary. It's the largest <coughs> college seminary. First, let's talk about that distinction, college seminary versus the Olligate. What are this, what's the difference? Sure, there? and uh, a lot of people get confused about that mm -hmm. at first. Um, people hear seminary and they think of guys walking around in Roman collars and studying theology and reading Thomas Aquinas and all these things, but mm -hmm. the college seminary is really for undergraduate men mm -hmm. who are discerning the call to the priesthood. Um, so the goal of the, the college seminary is not necessarily to produce a priest, mm -hmm. where once you're in major seminary, the expectation of your diocese is, yeah, I'm pretty set on being a priest for, right. for this local church. But a college seminary is a place where a man can go and discern the priesthood, um, kind of in a, a very open environment to that. Mm -hmm. But regardless of his, if he becomes a priest or if he discerns out, where the college seminary trains good fathers. Right. Good right. fathers. So you're on the campus, Eric, right, of St. Thomas. That's correct. Tell us about the... Is that a college or university? Or yep, yeah. it's, a, uh, it's a university, mm -hmm. the University of St. Thomas, mm -hmm. 6,000 undergraduate students, 4,000 graduate students. So we get to, as seminarians, interact on a day-to-day -day basis with the seminarians, mm -hmm. to eat with them, get to go to class with, or with the college students as seminarians, I should right. say. Mm -hmm. So we get to go to class with them, eat, have meals with them. Uh, it's, it's really a neat experience to be able to meet and minister these people on a college campus that we may be ministering to as a priest on the road mm -hmm. or may meet if we eventually become fathers, maybe in a dad's club or something like that in a parish or right. may work with something like that down the road. Right. So on the, there's one campus, right, University of St. Thomas uh, University and you have the seminary house. So you take all your classes with the college. That's right and you come out with a philosophy degree. Yep. And so we should tell the folks at home that, that uh, you know, to be a priest, you need an undergraduate degree, four years of theology, I get that question a lot. If you have a degree in something else, you need to take pre-theology credits and philosophy credits. I think today you need like 28 hours or something. Something like, something that, like yeah. that, Tell us about the philosophy there. You were really complimentary of it. Uh, yeah, the philosophy program at St. Thomas is, is excellent. Um, as somebody, I studied English before I entered mm -hmm. seminary, and uh, I'm not a philosopher by any means. Right. Um, and, and the philosophy can be kind of daunting at first, actually, if you're like, yeah. I've got to study. I'm not Aquinas. I'm not right. any of these famous philosophers. But um, the philosophy department at St. Thomas is actually one of the best in the country. Um, it's all very faithful Catholic uh, men and women who have, obviously, their doctorates in all kinds of different philosophy, medieval mm -hmm. philosophy, uh, modern philosophy, ethics, um, all kinds of different things, logic, all the different facets of philosophy. And so you start mm -hmm. um, with the historical sequence, so mm -hmm. Greek philosophy all the way through uh, modern and contemporary philosophy. You get classes in logic, basically mm -hmm. teaching us how to think like a right, philosopher right. using really logical skills. Yeah. Um, ethics, teaching us about morals and ethics and what would you do in this situation or what would you do in that situation and reading right. a lot of Aristotle right. and Plato, Aquinas, all kinds of things because, um, you know, they say ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. Right. Well, ignorance of philosophy is really ignorance of theology because yeah. all the theological principles of the church are based on philosophy. Right. We say philosophy is the handmaiden of theology, yeah, right? Exactly. That it it serves to help us to understand theology, to draw conclusions, and to make more explicit our faith, explicit our faith, and to explain it to the world. I and mean, that's four years of philosophy. That's a lot, uh, a lot of philosophy. So we got a clip now that's about the seminary, a little video that uh, Vianney Media put together. Right. So we uh, hope you enjoy this clip. St. John Vianney Seminary is located on the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. We are the largest college seminary, in, Catholic college seminary in the United States. About 132 men, so our building is full. Uh, we've been full for almost a decade, and that's a good problem to have. When people would ask me if I wanted to be a priest, I would always say no or hesitate because I had a lot of fears. I, I wasn't ready to say yes to something like that. My faith wasn't deep enough. I think a lot of guys come here with, with fears of, I'm not gonna be able to do this, or I've got a lot of things in my past that I'm worried about, or I'm dealing with something that couldn't possibly be dealt with. And that's where the call really comes in because it turns out that anybody could be called. Uh, and he often calls people 
who need growth first. My problem was I never really gave God a fair chance. And so for a lot of the guys, part of, part of getting over the fears of seminary is at least saying, okay, God, if this is something that you want, I'm gonna do it. The more you grow and realize you're not really uh, perfect, you're not you know, worthy of that responsibility, the more Jesus actually invites. Men who come to the seminary don't necessarily know for sure this is my vocation to be a priest, but they come with a certain openness to that and a certain desire to discern that. And we equip them with the wisdom and the tools to hear God's voice and to follow God. You know, half these guys will not become priests, half will become married, outstanding husbands and fathers as a result having been here. The others who become priests, uh, their formation at SJV will, will carry them through into the priesthood with a, a great vigor. You know, even just making the decision to come to seminary, you have to kind of come to terms with that, with yourself that, you know, you are different, um, specifically because you're Catholic, but also specifically because God's calling you to this unique, unique place. So how big is the seminary? Uh, the seminary is, uh, it's 135 men. 135. So we're the largest college seminary in the country. Right. Now, there are other college seminaries all over the country, mm -hmm. um, and uh, kind of goes by what part of the country you're from. So right. we have a lot of guys from Minnesota, from Wisconsin, Illinois, some from Indiana. Uh, we even have some guys from Mobile, Alabama, mm -hmm. and from Anchorage, Alaska. So they come from all over the place, mm -hmm. uh, but with the same goal to study uh, to become better men in Christ. Right. And you mentioned, uh, well, first, let's talk about maybe uh, a day in the life of a seminary. And you know, one of the purpose of this show is hopefully to inspire some young, young men to discern a call to the priesthood. What's a, a typical day like for you? We'll start with Eric here. Uh, well, it starts 6.15 in the morning, waking up, having Eucharistic adoration, a holy hour, praying morning prayer together as a community, and then having mass after that. Um, Monday, Wednesday, we have mass in the morning, Tuesday, Thursday, mass in the evening. Um, but starting that, that morning centered on the Lord and, and focused on Him uh, with the Eucharist is, is an uh, invaluable experience. You can't, you can't get that mm -hmm. at a regular college. And, and so to start, start with that and then go. And to have the go. whole seminary praying together like that for the Holy yeah. Hour, that must be powerful. I mean, yeah. you have the faculty there and everybody, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so. That's correct. And then to go throughout the rest of your day, go to breakfast and then classes and whatnot uh, mm -hmm. is kind of what we do. And then you have your, your afternoon is generally free for recreation. Uh, and then your evening, we come back together at five o'clock for evening prayer to pray and then dinner and um, meetings throughout the rest of the evening, meeting as fraternities with groups of men to kind of relate and uh, talk about our struggles and whatnot and graces in our lives. Um, so that's kind of your average day. Oh, there are like small group associations? Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Does everybody have to be part of some kind of smaller group? Or Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, your first day at SJV, you're assigned to a group. It's called a fraternity group. Okay. Um, and you meet for the first, really up until Thanksgiving, with an upperclassman who works mm -hmm. with your small group mm -hmm. of five or six men. And then after that, um, a, ca a captain is elected, and then you're with that same group of men until you leave St. John Vianney. Right. Um, and it's really a time to come together and just, and like, just like Eric said, to live in the light you know, to share strengths, where the Lord is blessing you, where the Lord is challenging you, um, and just to be accountable with your brothers. Oh, wow. And we should emphasize, maybe for a young man watching, that it is a time of discernment. It's just because you go and see doesn't mean, you know, you're committed or signed the dotted line, because a number of guys discern out, right, and uh, some guys uh, feel they are called and they persevere with that. Um, tell us about the camaraderie of a seminary. I know I've always enjoyed that. I, I wasn't expecting that when I went to seminary. You have a lot of fun. You know, you think of celibacy, schoolwork, formation. What fun, you know, that's not very fun, is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is a fun place. Tell us about that. Yeah, it really is. We uh, play a lot of sports, play mm -hmm. a lot of card games, um, really just kind of enjoy being with each other. It's not, uh, not so much you just have to go day in, day out, school, pray, right, school, right, pray, right. but you gotta, you gotta mix it up yeah. and uh, have some fun. We like to joke around a lot. Yeah. Um, not that we're not serious all, all the time. We, right. we do have times that we're serious, but there are, there's definitely a lot of time for fun, uh, and it's definitely a really enjoyable place. 
to be and to to live for the for the semester. I know Ryan and I can attest just sitting in Ryan's room um, throughout my years yeah. um, and just like joking around, having fun. Yeah. Um, it is. A, it's a great fraternal spirit in a seminary, and it's uh, very encouraging and strengthening. We've got to take a short break. We'll be back in just a moment with our seminarians, so don't go away. Back in a minute. Welcome back. Uh, the moment has come. We've now we're going to talk about Doug's shirt. Well, yeah, and, and, and the shirt will work into the question. Um, the shirt, um, this is the symbol. Uh, it's the 14th letter of the Arabic alphabet, the N. It's also, it's pronounced Noon, I believe. Um, and it translates over in the Middle East into uh, Nazarene. This is a symbol that was painted not too awfully long ago on many Christian homes throughout Mosul and other areas of Iraq marking them for persecution, serious persecution. We put the shirt together at BattleReadyStrong.com and we're offering it uh, for people. We're giving a portion of the proceeds if you buy it uh, through BattleReadyStrong.com. We're giving a portion of the proceeds to um, the Church in Need, a Catholic charity that is under the guidance of the Pope to uh, help uh, support the people that are over there suffering, still suffering. A big fan of the out of sight, out of mind. You know, if something's not in our sight, we forget about it. Uh, advertising agency makes gazillions of dollars off of that whole approach. You keep it in people's mind, they're going to be thinking about it. And we can't forget our Christian brothers and sisters. And not just over in Iraq and the Middle East where they're suffering. Tremendous persecution, beheadings and crucifixions and, and genocidal rape. And it's just amazingly horrific things happening over there right now. But all over the world this is going on, you know, in various places. Um, and it kind of plays into what I wanted to talk to you two about because I think, you know, when we, when we see stuff like this, this makes us think back to Tertullian's words in the early centuries of the church, that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And the persecution does help strengthen us if our hearts are in the right place. And we definitely offer this shirt because we want to show solidarity with brothers and sisters who were suffering in various forms, various types of persecution, challenges, difficulties throughout the world. But as priests, you go into seminary, Father Mark and other priests, and you young men discerning the priesthood, um, and seminary is somewhat like a, like a West Point, I like to refer to in the military, where it's a training and those who are ordained, men ordained, become officers on the spiritual battlefield. Um, but the enemy does know this too. And, and a, a college seminary named after St. John Vianney, who is a patron of all priests and was, was tormented amazingly by the enemy. Um, just on a, on a deeper level for you gentlemen who are discerning this and praying about this, knowing that you're at a seminary named after such a great saint, who dealt with the enemy on such a personal level, um, knowing that if you do feel that God calls you to complete this and you become priest, that you'll be in that spiritual officer on the battlefield sort of position. What's that, what's that like right now as you're going through that discernment? Because men, I believe, have the DNA in them to, as my friend Tom Sullivan is writing in his next book, Shamar, the word, the, the, the Hebrew word given to to Adam, shamar, protect. It's your job in the garden, protect the garden, protect the Eve. We men are supposed to shamar one way or another. You do it through prayer, sacraments, spiritual leadership. What's it like at this stage of your young men life, thinking about what this is all leading towards if it goes to the, to the end there? Well, it's freaky. I'll say, that. <laughs> I'll say it's freaky, that's for sure. Is that a deep philosophical term? <laughs> it is, it is, freaky. That's after four years of philosophy. That's right. <laughs> it comes from the Latin word. No, <laughs> Um, I always like to say that the first identity thief ever is the devil. Mm. And he was the first one who originated the whole crisis of identity theft in the world. And what we're living now is, I mean, among other things, which are, there's so many different facets to all of this, and I'm really not, I can't speak about all of them, obviously. But um, we have an identity crisis as Christians. Um, someone asked me earlier if, if I woke up tomorrow and, and that symbol was painted on the wall of the seminary outside, what would I do? Uh, and I looked at them and I said, I would jump for joy. I would shout hooray. Because in a court of law, if I was accused, if I was charged of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me? Mm. And I like to think that there would be. 
Um, but I think so much today when we, when we come, uh, you know, not everybody has the same um, interactions with the devil that St. John Vianney did. And for all those who are not familiar with that, um, his bed was lit on fire, it was dragged across the room, all kinds of crazy things happened to him. But for us, we're tempted. We're tempted not just to sin, but to, um, you know, not follow the Lord in, in the ways that he's calling us to, or the devil will, will cloud our mind in some way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and his whole main goal through that is to just rob us of our identity, to be the first identity thief in all of history. Um, and that's something that we have to be vigilant of. We have to be on the attack against that. Mm -hmm. And how we do that, I mean, there's a variety of different ways. Maybe I know Eric can speak to some different ways. Prayer, being steadfast, fasting, um, but just being vigilant of the fact that Jesus Christ is real and that Jesus Christ matters more than anything. Mm -hmm and that our relationship with him has to be the most important thing. And I think if we do those things, and Eric, you can certainly attest to that, if we can do these things, especially as yeah. men in the seminary, um, we're going to be golden mm. for the future. All right. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, if we, can, if we can keep up our, our prayer life as men of Christ, men of the church, and men for others, which is our motto of St. John Vianney College Seminary, mm. if we can do that, we truly can conquer anything. You know, the Lord says... In the, uh, in the Bible, if, uh, w or uh, he says, be not afraid, mm -hmm. JP2's, big thing. And he says that 365 times, the number of days in a year. If we can be not afraid, take that, take our prayer life, take that, that spiritual courage and combine those two on a day-to-day -day basis, 365 days a year, there's nothing we can't do. And that, that really is something that is necessary, is, is, is spiritual courage. I mean, it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, or it's a cardinal virtue, fortitude, courage. The idea that in order for us to, you know, um, really make it clear to the world who we are, the identity of, as Christians, you know, and, you know, even such as a symbol like this, that they would have this painted on their, on their homes over there, knowing what it means. They're going to be run out or put to the sword or, or what have you. Um, and the horrible things that have gone on over there and throughout the world. This is part of our, of our, our Christian identity, is persecution, conflict, struggle goes with it. Um, and the only way to endure that is a certain type of courage. But th do you think that the quality of courage is important too and the way that courage is trained up? Because we look at courage oftentimes as what the athlete does. Yeah, there's an element of courage there. Uh, that's not the same as, a, as the courage of a fireman who runs into a burning building or a police officer or military. But then there's also another degree of courage that has a spiritual element to it that even rises above all natural, um, that, that is really, it confounds the world. Like Peter getting out of the boat, walking on water. There's a certain courage in that. Made no sense. You know, didn't work into his 401k retirement plan. You know, he could sink mm. and drown and die. <laughs> Bad. Um, but do you think that spiritual courage needs to be trained, needs to be, needs to be cultivated? I would definitely say so. I would say that we, part of that training, part of that formation that we are given at the seminary is preparing us for that, preparing us to take that step, take that step into the water, out of the boat, mm -hmm. and, and trust in the Lord that He's going to provide for us, that we're not going to sink, that through our prayer, through our, uh, our activities, our fun, mm -hmm. stuff like that, our, our studies, through all these things, we are, we are prepared over these years, and that's why seminary is six to eight years, because we're being prepared for this, this battle, for that one opportunity to take that step out of the mm -hmm. boat, to trust in the Lord, and to go for it. Yeah. And I think you brought up something earlier, too, about the small groups. That's so important. They stressed that when I was in seminary, but we didn't have, like, small groups sharing like that. But to be united with other priests or seminarians, and that's very strengthening, very important. Uh, we have another video you mentioned from the motto uh, men in Christ men of the church and men for others uh, we have a video about that part of the motto men for others so let's watch that the man who's most joyful is the one who gives his life away because of love if you give your life away because of love you find joy you have a life of meaning and so the men here are taught at St. John Vianney and, and they take it on with great joy that they are men who are going to live for others. The seminary is definitely very like an active life. Like we're going out and we're doing outreach for people all over this archdiocese. Last year, I was tutoring some underprivileged children who are live in low-income housing, and this year, I'm teaching religious education. It's just good to get out and see the face of the people of God. Uh, 
as a group, whether that be, you know, young kids in a classroom who you're just trying to drill the gifts of the Holy Spirit into, or, um, you know, sometimes I visited nursing homes and just spent time with the elderly. I've been a part of Catholic Men's Leadership. It's a uh, Catholic men's group on the campus and University of St. Thomas. It's a group just designed for men who want to be good men. They want to be challenged and they want to grow into virtuous men and men of faith. The priesthood is geared towards people and you got to go where the people are at. Seeing these kids, my desire has grown to show them Jesus. And that's a tremendous mystery, a tremendous joy that a man is becoming Christ as he's pouring out his life in apostolic ministry. You know, while it's us doing something for others, it's really more of an activity of receiving. Uh, they do mission trips often in the spring where they may go to Alabama and help uh, Habitat for Humanity, building homes. They may go to Jamaica or Haiti and work with the poor there. Last Chance Mass, it's a, it's a campus, campus-wide mass uh, held at 9 p.m. on Sunday nights here at the seminary. Being a co-coordinator on the Last Chance Mass crew, you know, organizing greeters and lectors and Eucharistic ministers, uh, really gave me a window into the Catholic identity of the campus that I hadn't seen before. And they really transformed my view of this campus and how much people hunger uh, for Christ. If we are really filled with divine life, it overflows. And the seminarians here, it all begins with their prayer life, in the morning with their holy hour and their daily mass. And they're filled up with God, and they go out into the world, even in their studies and the environment of their present state of life, and they want to be a shining light. And that's the overflow of God's presence and goodness. Ryan, tell us about your call to the priesthood. Call. You had a, a great uh, story about your call. Yeah. Um, like so many young men, well, first of all, every young man should ask himself, is the Lord asking me to be a priest? Mm -hmm. Every young Catholic man owes it to the church to ask that question. And, uh, you know, the Lord, the priesthood, they say, is either something that comes upon you suddenly, like a St. Paul conversion mm -hmm. moment, or it's something that you've grown up with gradually, right. quietly. Yeah. And I can say that I've wanted to be a priest since I was seven mm -hmm. years old. I, I would play mass at, in my living room. We would use um, Oreos and apple juice mm -hmm. for mass. I actually almost burnt my house down once doing that, <laughs> so much to the chagrin of my mother. But um, the Easter vigil, is that? <laughs> yes, the Easter vigil, that's right, that's right. She didn't like the bonfire in the house, but she did not understand my ways, unfortunately. I always said the Lord puts fire where he wants it, right? <laughs> um, so as you get older, though, as you go through high school, I went to public high school, um, public schools all my, my time. And uh, it's not the most popular thing in the world to want to be a priest, mm -hmm. um, especially amongst people who maybe don't share the same conviction to the church or the same understanding of the faith as uh -huh. you. Um, and so that kind of fell away, but I got really interested in music. I played the trombone. I was a drum major of marching band. Uh, I did all the, the plays and theater. I did speech team and was successful in all those things. And so I, I said, well, you know, I, I'd like to be a teacher someday, so why not do something along those lines? So I went to college for a year uh, at a smaller school in Illinois where I'm from uh -huh. um, to study English and secondary education, actually. And when I got there, I started helping out with the parish, which is mm -hmm. right next to the campus, um, one of the largest parishes in our diocese. And uh, I started serving there every Sunday night and, and just really started to meet priests and, and really kind of see a different side to them that I hadn't really thought of before. Mm -hmm. Now, I hadn't thought of the priesthood in probably three or four years at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I was serving the Midnight Mass uh, at their church. I was one of the MCs for it. I was the the incense guy, so mm -hmm. I was already kind of woozy, you know, yeah. as Mass was going yeah. on, and, and the Gospel is being read, so the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, truly present in the church in some way, and I actually heard my name called. Right. Um, someone whisper my name, Ryan, you know, and so mm -hmm. I looked around, and I didn't know who it was, and I was, like I said, I was like maybe hallucinating from all the smoke or something, <laughs> who knows. Um, so Mass kind of went on, and during the, the Eucharistic prayer, the epiclesis, you know, when the, when the priest says, send down your spirit uh -huh. upon these gifts, and make them holy. As soon as he said, send down your spirit, I heard my name again, um, mm. kind of like a beckoning way. And all the people that I thought it could be, I, I had visual contact with that time. And, and the thing that was different the second time was that the word priesthood came into my head for the first time in years, and it just repeated, priesthood, 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 priesthood. And suddenly all these memories of me playing mass, telling people I was going to be the first American pope, um, <laughs> all these different things started c coming back to me, and I was like, what am I, I'm missing out on something. Yeah. I'm missing out on, 
what's really going on? And it was ironic because I, that was the first night I'd ever met a seminarian before. And right before Mass, he, he said to me, Ryan, you're going to be the next seminarian really? for the diocese. Really? And I said, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't know very many things, do you? Uh, so, yeah, just a really powerful moment. And, and from there, you know, the Lord, that was the spark. And then the Lord's continued to really build the fire over the last, um, this will be my fourth year in seminary now. And you said, here I am, send me. Sort basically, of Isaiah <laughs> basically. At the throne room and the incense and that's the, right. the repetition. Before that's I said that, though, there was a few of, you mean me? Are you sure? Are you sure you mean me? Are you mean? You? <laughs> right, okay, right. great. Here I am, send me. You know? <laughs> but I know we were talking earlier, and you, you mentioned uh, you did get some pushback. You were in college for yeah. uh, one year. Well, not a secular place, but... Uh, what would you tell a young man out there who he's in a culture that's saying this is not a good thing? Um, I'd echo what Eric said earlier, and I would echo what um, now St. John Paul II said mm -hmm. a million times, do not be afraid. Um, you know, they say the most masculine virtue of Christ is endurance. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes things come to us and they look pretty grim and they look like maybe I don't really want uh, to keep continue on this route, but I have to endure for the sake of Christ. So I got made fun of a lot by guys who didn't understand the priesthood and only saw the priesthood in, in the negative light that it was presented, right, you know, in the right, news media right, or something. Right. And, um, and so their reactions were very negative and, a lot, and my parents yeah, experienced yeah. the same thing when they yeah. found out their son wanted to be a priest. Right, right. But you know what, that's, a lot of people, that's their only knowledge of the priesthood, yeah. good or bad, right. you know, and so that's, the, that's what they're gonna give me, that's the reaction they're gonna give me. That doesn't change the truth that yeah. Christ is, Christ is, first of all, and that Christ is calling me to do something great for him. And I think that reminds us too the importance of if you're a young man discerning to get to know your priest and because there's a lot of great inspirational priests out there. I know it helped me in my life to know priests and you know I remember just something simple is here. You know we've had so many priests come to EWTN and, and preach at the mass and things and finally it just hit me and said these are men of joy. Yeah. It looks like a good life, a fulfilling happy life and that was important. Being in seminary, meeting some guys that really inspired me, some priests. Uh, so get to know your priests, talk to them, and uh, let them inspire you. We're going to take another break. We'll show you another video uh, from this movie, When the Game Stands Tall, these interviews I did. And these, the next two are the two young actors that played a couple of the football players uh, in the movie, uh, Sidarius Blaine and Alexander Ludwig, who was in The Hunger Games. Uh, so we hope you enjoy uh, this interview. So I wanted to ask you both about, for you personally, what was the impact of the film meeting the, coach, the coaches and the players. What was your takeaway from the film? Alex, let's start with you. Um, I think it's an, uh, a great, great story uh, of, uh, of these two men, you know, Bob and, and Terry, who amongst all the craziness that, and the commotion that you know, a sports can, can bring, and, and in a very good way, right. um, they never lost sight of why they were there. Ironically, that's why they won all those games, mm -hmm. was because they were there to teach kids to become men and to mm -hmm. become dependent on um, and in terms of um, uh, faith uh, they that, uh, that I think was a huge part of bringing them together um, and I think being in that school when not only were they you know in the same classrooms whatnot but they were also they had each other to lean on and whatnot that that was a very very big part of why they were successful and why they were so close mm -hmm. well you know the race isn't given to the swift or the strong, but to the one who can endure until the end. And this story hits that right on the head. I mean, it, when you think about the story of Job in the Bible, and not, not to compare this, this story to Job, but the tribulations and stuff that he was able to go through and still maintain his faith in God at the end of the day, uh, I related that to my character, to mm -hmm. Cam Colvin, you know, between losing a mother, losing a father, losing a best friend, and having your sibling wrenched from your arms. You know, you, you can't lose much more than that in life. And in order, you know, all of our fates are, are, are shaken and, and, and tested at times. Uh, but to hold on to, to God and know, know that in the end, he'll never leave you or forsake you, that's, that's one of the biggest proponents of when the game stands tall. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, I'm, I'm ecstatic to be able to tell that story. Yeah. And I know sometimes uh, in the world, faith is looked at something that can hold you back. Do you see that, like faith in this case we see as making them better football players. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that theme in your life? Any, anyone who, who tells you that, that faith can never hold you back has never been through anything. Mm -hmm. um, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. You know what I mean? And, and we, 
we have to hold on to that. We have to have something to believe in uh, because there is a higher power. You know what I mean? There's no way that we would be here if there weren't. You know what I mean? We're not machines. And so at the end of the day, faith and holding on to, to what is to come right. um, is, is probably most, one of the most important lessons in life that, that we have to have because it keeps you going. It's that fuel that you need to survive. And Alex, a, a great theme in your character was humility. Uh, how did you approach that? Because you, I mean, that was the big turning point of the game, the movie. I thought, uh, yeah, humble yourself. Yeah, well, it was very, uh, it was very humble of him. But at the same time, it, I mean, the reason he did that was to, to show the coaches that what they do, does make a difference. To honor them. And to honor them, and that mm -hmm. it's not about winning the games. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and Cam knew that from mm -hmm. the beginning. And it's it's, it's about you know, becoming men and knowing that you can be dependent on and giving a perfect effort. So that was kind of an homage, homage and, you know, and yeah. like, uh, like and giving I don't back. I cut you off, but no, I, please I have do. to say this, but even in real life, I mean, this guy is tremendously successful. But when you sit down and have a conversation with him, he is one of the most humble guys ever. So this was not a stretch from who he is in real life. I mean, we were getting stopped constantly in the streets and people asking him for autographs or people walking by and just taking pictures without asking and he was so gracious about it at all times he was he was making people's days you know mm -hmm. what I mean by nice by maintaining that level of humility and that um, which I told him when I first met him that's what's going to increase his trajectory and, and make him continue to go as far as he is going so I mm -hmm. mean the, he played himself almost I you know? love you, man. <laughs> uh, don't touch me <laughs> <laughs>
traveled all over. We did part of the Camino in Spain, um, traveled to Paris and Luxembourg, all kinds of different areas. Mm -hmm. um, but it was amazing because part of the program is the opportunity to study at the Angelicum in Rome, the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, which is a Dominican school. Um, and you know, you, you think here, you know, I got to study all this philosophy, and oh my goodness, I have to keep you know doing all these things, and I just I don't think I can handle it. What's this really going to benefit the church anyway? <laughs> but then you go and you get on us, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Um, then you go and you see all these people from all over the world, all these different religious orders, seminarians from countries you've never even heard of, um, who come together to study philosophy and theology um, for the church. And you meet these professors and these people who are like the most brilliant people you've ever known in your entire life. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just so much beauty to that side of the church. To the, you feel connected to the, to the wider church. What I'm right. doing is really a service to the wider church. Right. It's, it's really amazing. It is. And uh, that's where John Paul II studied at the that's Angelicum. Right. And, that's right. uh, and to be able to go to Rome to see the beauty of the churches, I mean, it just, uh, you know, for an American, that is, that is a real education. And like you said, to, to get connected to the somewhat of the intellectual tradition to meet these uh, professors, you know, at the, the top of the game over there, you know, yep. so to speak. And to be in the square, right? You've been to general audiences with yep. Pope Francis? Yeah, we went to one general audience in um, at the beginning of our semester in October, mm -hmm. and it's totally worth it, but it's only really worth it once, you know, because you got to get up early and you got to <laughs> beat the crowds. And uh, actually, a nun, a sister and I, we had a staring contest at the security gate. Right. Um, she was maybe half my height, little Italian sister, and, and she looked at me, and, and I was looking at her because she wanted to beat me through. <laughs> and uh, and I just said, buona fortuna, which means good luck in Italian. <laughs> and she just said, grazie. <laughs> of course, I beat her through. but uh, So it's just kind of fun, the camaraderie, the camaraderie amongst yeah. people in yeah. the square. And the Urbi at Orbi blessing at Christmas time. Actually, I got to sing in the, it's called the People's Choir, right. which is right behind the altar. Um, for Midnight Mass inside mm -hmm. of St. Peter's with the Pope. So just amazing experiences. Okay. Eric, I forgot to ask you about the websites. Can you give us a website for Vianney Media and for maybe the College Seminary? Yeah, the, uh, the main website is Vianney.net. So just as it says on our shirts, Vianney.net. Yeah. Okay. Pretty simple, try to keep it easy. Mm -hmm. All right, for everything then. Okay. Yeah, yep. All the um, Vienna Media has a tab on there. Uh, there's Vienna Visit on there for um, prospective guys thinking about maybe their call to the seminary. Um, there's numerous other tabs, including Last Chance Mass, um, right. which is a mass at uh, 9 p.m. On, on Sunday evening that is celebrated by our rector mm -hmm. um, for the campus, for the University of St. Thomas, um, open to the public. So it, you can find just about anything you want to know about the seminary on that website. Right. And don't forget to like our Facebook page. That's very important. SJV, St. John Vianney College Seminary, St. Paul MN. That's right. where it's at. And also, this coming this year, we've got a, a new program we're starting called Vianney Radio, mm -hmm. um, which is going to feature podcasts and things from uh, the men at, at SJV, which we'll be posting. So it's, it's exciting. We're, we're always starting something new. Right. Now, Eric, can you tell us something about your call uh, to the pre to the be a seminary and hopefully a priest? Uh, Tell us about some of the aspects of that that maybe a young man might identify with mm -hmm. for you. Yeah, I, uh, when I was young, I never, never ruled out being a priest. Mm -hmm. I always thought, always looked up to the priests, always enjoyed being in the parish, uh, just s serving Mass and mm -hmm. um, being around in general. And just going through high school, um, always kind of had it in the back of my head, but never really pursued it, never prayed a lot about it, just kind of let it linger. Mm -hmm. And um, then I went, uh, went off to college. Um, as I was kind of discerning where to go for college, uh, I wasn't certain, and that was because the Lord kind of had said, well, I want you to eventually go to seminary, uh, but I wanted to go and play golf. That was right. my, my right. big passion. <laughs> so I went to community college in Ann Arbor for a year and, uh, and then eventually discerned through actually one of my best friends who goes to the University of Notre Dame he sent me a text message out of the blue, said, I think you'd make a good priest. And that's all it said. And I was just like, all right, that is very <laughs> random. Yeah. Um, but he later called me and explained to me his floor priest at Notre Dame had inspired him or inspired the, the men on the floor to just pursue vocation. And if there was anyone they thought would make a good priest, just to kind of give them that little extra nudge. And so mm -hmm. sure enough, he did. And and it helped give me that push and, and to pursue St. John Vianney. Yeah. And, uh, 
and here I am today. All right, praise God. You have one more year left. That's correct. And Ryan, you finished college seminary, so you're now. I did. Yeah, that's the sixth way that we know God exists is that <laughs> I finished philosophy. Um, so I've just actually just two weeks ago I started um, first theology at Mundelein Seminary, which is in the Archdiocese of Chicago. Right. Well, Father Robert Barron's the rector. He's the rector. So yep. Great. Yep. Well, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you very much, Father. Great show. Yeah, and thank you uh, so much, Father. We'll be sure to check out your videos at VNA Media, Media and keep you in prayer. So. Thank you. Well, may our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week.